Okay, well, the number of participants, uh, nope, there's, there's, there's one, one more person just came in. Hello, but take a seat anywhere, there's plenty of room. Um, okay, so it looks like the number of participants has stopped going up. So um, hello and welcome to Making Much of Masks. Um, I'm gonna read the description. Rituals, rules, intimidation, exposure, and protection. Masks have always been a part of our culture, but what are their stories? From Mask of the Red Death to Mirror Mask, Darth Vader and Star Wars and everything in between and beyond. What are the masks that we use today and where will they take us? Uh, so this is definitely a topical topic. Um, my name is David D. Levine. I'm your moderator. Uh, I'm a writer of science fiction and fantasy. I've published over 50 short stories and three novels um, and collected a number of awards, including this Hugo here. Uh, don't, usually get to, don't usually get to show it off. Um, yes, uh, if you have questions for us, um, I will not be, I'm your moderator. I will not be monitoring the chat, but I will be uh, looking at the Q and A. Uh, so if you have any, any cues for us to A, uh, feel free to put them in there and we'll get to them something in the vicinity of uh, halfway through, depending on whether the press of questions is, is great. Um, so I would like my fellow panelists to introduce themselves, uh, and I will start with Wen Spencer, who's first on my screen. Hello, I'm Wen Spencer. I've got a number of books. It's around 14. I keep on losing track. Uh, most recent out is a reissuing in trade paperback of my Tinker in preparation of a two-book, two-part book coming out, uh, Harbinger which should be out next year, the year after. Um, I was hoping to get it done this year and it turned into a monster. Um, and now it's gonna be two books. So um, when it gets done, it gets done. Okay, thank you very much. You and I, you and I were up on this, you, you beat me for the Campbell if I, if I recall correctly. Yes, I did. <laughs> yes, okay, congratulations You've on got that. a rocket ship. Uh, okay. Hmm? Eventually, any. yes. <laughs> it took a few more years, I'll tell you. Um, okay, so uh, let's go with uh, Bill Higgins. Uh, hi, uh, I, Bill Higgins, am a, uh, have, have not figured out how to change my uh, identity from William S. Higgins uh, in the square, but, uh, but let's go with that. Uh, I'm a, 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 a physicist uh, at... Uh, uh, doing radiation safety at Fermi Lab, uh, not far from Chicago, and uh, I'm uh, just uh, otherwise. I'm active in fandom, and I've I've been interested in the history of science fiction and fantasy, and I've written a little bit about those things. Thank you, um, and Rachel Swirsky, uh, would you please introduce yourself? You're muted. Good. Um, I, I teach on Zoom and mostly we try to mute when we don't have, when we're not actively lecturing and uh, um, also warn people that everyone will start to talk while muted. So, you know, luckily I know this is not uncommon. Um, I'm Rachel Swirsky. I'm a short story writer primarily. Um, I have a nebula instead of a rocket, um, but it's not tidally behind me. Um, and um, I... I'm very uh, interested in seeing where we go with this conversation. Um, I, I know that we've you suggested a few things like uh, mask is identity, and I'm curious to see how we go forward. Okay, um, so uh, let's start off by asking for uh, what are some intriguing uses of masks that you have seen in fiction, either uh, either written, filmed, or or for that matter, in audio. Well, I was going to go with real life, um, though it kind okay. of came into fiction. Um, before all this happened, the huge fashion wave that was taking over South Korea and Japan were face masks. Um, kids were wearing them as a fashion statement, and that bled over to the video games, and a lot of the video games have characters that you could that have mask. Uh, I play Final Fantasy XIV, which you can put multiple thousands of different costumes on, and an excessive number of them come with a mask um, to the point where you're like, what is it with the mask? Uh, so it 
is actually a huge part of the world that masks are cool and embraced and uh, are part of day and day fashion. That's cool. It's definitely, it is definitely a thing. Uh, it's not even a new thing. There have been masks in fashion for a long, long time. I know, uh, I know about, uh, I know that they have been important in fashion in a lot of European cultures uh, and that they've been important in other ways in other cultures around the world, probably fashion as well. Um, Bill, have you, have you encountered any uh, intriguing uses of masks, either in fiction or for that matter in real life? Well, I am reminded that uh, for complicated reasons, I got interested in Chillicothe, Illinois, the, which is the hometown of Johnston McCulley. So last year I attended the centennial celebration of uh, McCulley's first story about Zorro, the masked uh, uh, champion uh, of, uh, of, of, of justice and, uh, and uh, the poor and the weak and so forth. Um, and uh, so, so there's, uh, there, there were a few Zorro masks uh, seen in the, at, at that event. Uh, and, uh, and now it's 101 years, but this November will be, will, will be the 100th anniversary of the movie they made out of this story like a year after it was published and the uh, Douglas Fairbanks, the senior in, uh, in uh, the Mark of Zorro. So, uh, so the, which, which remains a great movie of its era. Mm -hmm. So yes. I think about and Zorro they... when I think about masks. Yeah. Yeah. We got, oh, well, there's, there's tons. I mean, there's the man in the iron mask. There's, um, there's the Lone Ranger. Um, there are, uh, generations of masked heroes, uh, both super and non. Um, Rachel, uh, if you if you feel like, would you like me to call upon you, or would you like me to wait for you to raise your hand? Um, I can. I'll try to. I'll try to participate as best I can. So feel free to call on me. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, what are some what so are some I examples have, of masks um, that you um, have decided to helpfully put up a comic? that was relevant to our topic uh, like a couple of days ago. So I thought I would share that uh, link. It's in chat. Also, <laughs> uh, I wanted to recommend what I always think of um, first in masks in science fiction is, uh, oh gosh, it's always so hard to remember the title even when I don't have a migraine. Sinner, Baker, Fabulous, Priest, Red Mask, Black Mask, Gentleman, Beast, which was the uh, Nebula winning story by late and lamented UG Foster, uh, which is a story that is about masks and uh, weird cultures. So I, I do recommend picking it up. Um, I guess uh, when I think about masks in fiction, I'm interested in the fact that masks symbolize transformation so that if you have a mask, it symbolizes the rest of your body changing. And of course we all know that from like superhero stuff where you put on a Batman mask and now you're not you and no one can tell that you're you. Um, and the glasses of course functioning sort of like a mask for Superman. Um, but I mean, it goes way further back, right? If you look at the old farces, and um, I think both, uh, certainly the Western European, the English, the French, but I think you got the same thing in Japanese farces as well. Um, if somebody at a party puts on a mask at a masquerade, then no one, including their spouse, can recognize them anymore, which is how people are able to commit adultery. Um, you know, and not get caught because their mask is completely. Um, and I suspect that this has to do, to the extent that it is a cross-cultural phenomenon, um, I suspect this has to do with our obsession with faces. Um, it's hard to transform something entirely. So if you're gonna use something as symbolic for transformation, it makes sense that what we're talking about is covering, um, covering the face, uh, covering the part of you that, you know, around your eyes where you're going to see expression in the skin. Um, and uh, that is the symbolic, that's what I came up with masks from science fiction when I was thinking before the panel. So 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. The, um, I, when the topic of masks in science fiction, uh, the first story I thought of is uh, The Moon Moth uh, by Jack Vance, um, which mm-hmm. is the masks are, the masks in that story are basically just part of the alien culture. And I say alien as near as I can, as near as I can tell the, the, the inhabitants of the planet in uh, the moon moth are just as human as the, as the other characters. But this particular culture, everyone has a mask and, and your mask portrays your status within society and you have to earn the right uh, to wear certain, certain specific fancy masks. So basically the, your mask is your whole cultural identity. It's your, it's your class, your caste, it indicates how much money you have, what your religion is. Um, and it's, it's only part of the science fictional aspect in that our main character is a police person who is tracking a criminal who is wearing a mask in order to blend in with the populace. And nobody knows exactly, he doesn't know exactly which one, which one this person is. So the mask is used to hide in the crowd. Uh, whereas uh, Rachel's talking about examples of the mask being used uh, to portray or, um, or uh, imperson- impersonate another person, to take on the full personhood and identity of somebody completely else. I had heard one time um, that the, the pagan religion of, uh, take, of taking off clothes and being naked was more to disguise the, um, what part of the strata this, of society the person is in because the people's clothing were so unique that they pinpointed where they stood in society more than anything else. And it was an interesting opposite of a mask, where you're taking something off to disguise what you are. Where a mask, you can keep your clothes on and you just cover up what really is the identifier. Yeah, I'm reminded of the old joke. Little uh, little little kid comes in and says to their mommy, "Mommy, mommy, there's a bunch of kids out there with no clothes on." And the mother says, "Boys or girls?" And the kid says, "I don't know. They aren't wearing clothes." Which, which, you know, you've got, what is, what is the phrase, the signified and the signifier? You know, in some, in some cases, it's impossible to see, you know, if they aren't wearing a mask, you know, how do you know what their, what their place in society is? Or in this case, if they aren't wearing clothes, how do you know what their place in society is? I had not known that. That is, fasc- that is fascinating. I will use that in the future. Um, you might want to fast. So that. what about... It's, it's completely oh, yeah, intuitive. was telling me the truth. We did get a question in chat, um, and I gave an answer. Uh, when you write a character that is sometimes wearing a mask, um, how do you identify for the reader when the mask is on? I'm sorry, David. I, I actually just wanted to point out that the question was there, and then I took control of the conversation. I will hand it back now, but we had that question in chat. OK. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a perfectly good question. Um, when do you want to tackle that one? I would just say that you make sure that when the masks go on, you mention he's putting on the mask. Um, and then every now and then sprinkle it in. Um, yes, yes, because that's with just about everything as to whether or not you're wearing, you know, fancy clothes or really disgusting clothes or anything. I, I'm not really a good person to say that because, um, I tend to write really sparse descriptions of people. Uh, I can go two or three books and people are like, what does the hero look like? He's got dark eyes. Uh, So um, it's, that's a hard one for me to answer. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. But the thing is, is that I do tend to keep careful track of like, you know where where did the reader where where did where did the character leave their gun, um, or or who's standing with their back to the w- back to the window, um, and so if that's important, then uh, it just happens to be my brain keeps track of that sort of thing, and so I remember that the reader doesn't always know these things, and so you just drop in little things like like I adjusted my mask before speaking, you know it's not it's not that hard. There are plenty of uh, plenty of basic writer, writerly techniques to uh, to deal with that. That's very similar um, to what I said, David. I'm sorry, you're continuing. 
Okay, yeah. Um, I'm reminded of a uh, role play, uh, of a LARP, a live action role play game uh, that I was not, I was not involved in it, but this was taking place at a convention I was at. Um, and this was, a, this was a LARP that took place in the uh, 1960s Batman universe. So it was, it was really kind of a kind of a ludicrous campy kind of universe. And so all the characters were permitted to put on another name badge, to stick another name badge in front of their in front of their in character name badge. So it, so if Batman sticks a piece of paper that says Joker in front of his jo in front of his Batman name badge, now he's now he's dressed as the Joker. And the rules of the LARP were that if somebody if somebody was wearing that mask, then you had to pretend that you couldn't tell who they really were. Um, so and and that that pretending it's like the way that we pretend that the uh, the stagehands dressed in black are invisible, even though everyone can see them perfectly well. If somebody's moving around on the stage wearing black, we just pretend that they're not there. And so I think that characters in opera, for example, uh, all agree that when you're wearing a mask, we, we pretend that we don't know who you actually are, even though everybody totally can. It was interesting. Um, I'm, I'm interested. interested. Please. I, I was thinking. If I'm remembering right, a good many of the Shakespeare plays, the women seemed to know exactly who the men were, but the men could never figure it out. Um, and I always found that interesting in the plays, that uh, it, it only went one way. Mm -hmm. I think that's very reflective of real life, frankly. Um, yeah, it's, tr it's true that Shakespeare has a lot of masquerades and generally speaking, people, the, the action continues and, and the humor and the drama continue despite the fact that almost everybody can see through the mask. Um, because especially when royalty is involved, we do a certain amount of pretending that we don't know, uh, that, that we don't know that that, that that guy in the mask is the king. Um, because if you if you called them out on it, you'd probably get beheaded. Um, speaking of beheading people for not wearing a mask, let's talk about um, Zorro and uh, and the Man in Black and the Lone Ranger and Batman and all the other masked heroes. If people are doing good stuff, why do they need to put on a mask? Uh, <laughs> Superman doesn't even bother with one. In mm -hmm. fact. But, but the Superman answer is the standard comic book answer that, uh, that you have a private life, you have relatives and, and people close to you who might be vulnerable to evildoers. And so you, uh, you don't want your uh, true identity to be, to be generally known. You, you, you become this other disguised persona and... Uh, yeah, the Scarlet Pimpernel or or whoever, and uh, and you do your your uh, your swashbuckling deeds uh, in in that guise, and it the firewall between that disguise as Batman and your identity as Bruce Wayne is very important to maintain, and the the and 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 threatening that firewall is always a good source of plot developments for the writers. Yeah. The best stories, um, the heroes actually fighting against a greater force. I mean, Zorro and uh, others like that, it's, there is a force that will crush you if you don't stay one step ahead of you. Um, right, so if they find out who you are. Yeah. Yeah, V for Vendetta definitely plays on that idea. Um, this is, as somebody in chat pointed out, a great segue to the recent Watchmen series. Uh, have you all seen it? Unfortunately, no. Uh, okay, if, so if in, you're the, asking, in the recent... If you're asking, Quis Custodes, is Custodia, the answer is that I am not the one that watches the Watchmen. Thank you. It's, it's okay. good, it, that's okay, so that's... That's one I can take off the list. There are oh, you, you were gonna make that other people. <laughs> yes. That's yes, one no, no, I, I, I to could, but I don't want to pay for HBO at this point in time. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do this thing of, of paying for HBO for a month every once in a while, and then I binge the HBO series that have come up in the last few months. Um, and so I did see Watchmen fairly recently. It is a really interesting follow-up to the uh, comic books uh, from, from, gosh, 20 years ago? No, 1980s, more like 40 years ago. Um, and like it plays with, old. Yeah, it, it pays, it pays with the, it plays with the amount of time that has gone past because the original comic book dealt with a period of time from like the 20s up until the present day of, of I believe it was 1978 in the comics, although they came out in, in like 84. Um, but, the, but then, so you've got a lot of history and then the new TV show deals with the history of what's happened since then. Um, in the TV show, uh, the, the cops, the ordinary, the ordinary police officers are wearing masks in response to violence against cops by armed vigilantes. And so there's a, there's a big inversion of who's hiding from whom and the masks and the use of people whose identities are unclear uh, becomes, a, becomes a, big, a big both plot and thematic element of the TV show. Um, yeah, yeah, no, no, the Watchmen TV show, I, I highly recommend it. Um, the, the use of masks to hide, um, to hide from the more powerful enemy, uh, which, which uh, is that, uh, Man in the Iron Mask, uh, the, the Man in the Iron Mask was actually the King's twin brother. Am I remembering that right? It's been a long time. Yeah, I, I don't remember the story as well as yeah. I should to have discuss it intelligently. Um, yeah. I believe, if I'm remembering it right, there is a twin involved. Yeah. And so where the, this is, this is the use of a mask not to, not to uh, hide as somebody, not to hide from somebody or to hide as somebody, but prevent you from using your face as your identifier. Yeah. Yeah, I got the impression that if I'm remembering it correctly, time goes by and he escapes. And when he comes, it's the fact that he's aged and the age becomes the mask um, more than the mask itself. Um, if I'm remembering it correctly. Uh, so he no longer looks like his brother because they both, because they're both older. I believe that is. Um, okay. It's getting kind of messed up with Zelda, the prisoner of Zelda, uh, where you do have twins and one is a commoner and one is a, um, a prince and they kind of swap places and, and things like that. And, um, so I, I'm having trouble keeping them separate. Uh, the Prisoner of Zelda by Anthony Hope? Yeah. Zenda, okay. Yeah. Zenda, not Zelda. Yeah. No, Zelda's yeah. Zelda's a video game. Yeah. Okay. Cool. 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 Um, okay. And Rachel brings up in chat the Phantom of the Opera. Uh, now, the interesting thing about the Phantom of the Opera, and that's another kind of mask that we haven't yet discussed, is the Phantom of the Opera, like Darth Vader, is a person who is using a mask to hide their their disfigured face, and also in order to prevent a, present a more menacing appearance. Um, so, so there's some, there's some stuff around ableism there. Um, and there's, um, and there's also a way to use a mask to create a personality. Um, anybody feel like tackling that idea? Well, I think that we all kind of do masks when we're uh, writers and put on panels like this because uh, we tend to be introverts and shy, and you have to learn to present a personality that is bigger and bolder and braver than your own. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, there are, um, well, I mean, I personally find, uh, I've done a little bit of acting, and certainly the costume, even without a mask, helps me put myself into the character. I also notice um, that shoes have an enormous impact on how, on my, my level of self-confidence that like when I wear, when I wear cowboy boots, 
um, <laughs> that hit the ground hard. They make, they make a loud sound. They make me two inches taller. I'm a lot more confident uh, in heels. Um, and I've heard a lot of people, a, a lot of people say the equivalent, uh, this the same or equivalent thing. So I can certainly see that a mask, which changes your outer appearance and also hides who you really are, could make you a lot more confident. Yes, Bill. So uh, you have, I, I, I am, a, I am a, a guy who has sometimes organized programs. So it sounds to me, what I'm hearing from you is there should be next year at Conaluence a shoes panel <laughs> as a sequel to the masks panel. A lot can be said about shoes. I mean, certainly, certainly, uh, you know, just invite, uh, let's see, Mary Robinette, Koal, um, and um, uh, uh, Liz Gorinsky, um, and uh, I can, I can, um, Liz Argel, I can think of, I can, I can probably think of a half dozen people, all of whom are really into flu vogs. Um, so you could have an entire panel on flu vog shoes. Uh, yeah, yeah, some boots are made for walking for sure. Um, oh. oh yeah, yeah, somebody in chat points up, Dr. Doom is also both disfigured and wearing the mask to look scarier. Yes, when? I, I want to remind Bill that he has a mask beside him that he wanted to talk to about. And we only have about 10 or 15 minutes left, so. Um, okay, I, I missed yeah. that, thank you. Well, he showed me before you came in. Uh-oh, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to hear. Uh, uh, here is my, here's my mask. We'll talk loud. <laughs> yeah, that's good, thanks, keep that up. Our top story tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Land shark. Oh. Now, of course, you know, you might be able to hear us, but we will probably not be able to hear you. No, it is not. It goes like this. It's been a long time since we were, uh, we were flying jet fighters in the Navy. Were you in the Navy? There we go. He is a pilot. Anyway, this, this helmet comes with a, uh, with, with a mask. Uh, and uh, I, I wanted to uh, maybe talk about uh, sort of functional masks that uh, are, are, are beneficial. Uh, that, uh, that, and I thought about, uh, about uh, the, when I thought about this subject, I went back to to the end of the 1700s and the beginning of the night of the 1800s, when uh, when new gases were uh, being discovered in the atmosphere or in in chemistry experiments, and people started to classify them and try to measure what their effects were on uh, on people and animals, in in and uh, in in hope of maybe you know finding new useful therapy or whatever. Uh, oxygen was discovered mm -hmm. uh, and by Joseph Priestley, um, and within a decade or two, people were experimenting with giving patients oxygen and seeing, uh, and and uh, uh, nitrous oxide was discovered, and uh, and you have mm -hmm. folks like Thomas Beddoes and Humphrey Davy having parties where people are experimenting with inhaling various things from the chemistry lab. And they really like and don't, and don't forget and don't forget the benefits of ozone. There's an ozone park in New York City when it was considered yeah. a healthful thing. I'm not sure when ozone. So several people. Had... Yeah. Sorry, but we we during the course of the 19th century, um, the doctors started to use masks to administer anesthetic uh, gases chloroform and, 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 and ether and, uh, and laughing gas, of course. And, uh, and also uh, in parallel, oxygen is great stuff and sometimes a patient needs it. And it turns out when that, uh, that it was really useful to aviators. Uh, so uh, balloonists started bringing the oxygen, bring oxygen along with them at high altitudes. And when, uh, when airplanes came along, it wasn't long before before oxygen seemed to be a good idea, and you get equipment like uh, like this. So in 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 uh, the the 
the description of the panel mentions Darth Vader. And mm -hmm. uh, I realize that Darth Vader's got a, a mask, which is very scary, like Dr. Doom, but it's actually part of something that's keeping him alive because in his backstory, he's got uh, a sword fight, a lightsaber fight with a, where he's terribly, terribly injured. And so he, it's machinery keeping him alive. And that's why there's a that heavy breathing. And there's probably a lot to say about this kind of thought. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and certainly the masks that are so controversial right now are definitely uh, used to help keep people alive. Both the, both the, the antiseptic masks that the general public wears and the uh, ventilator masks that uh, people unfortunately have to wear uh, when, they're, when they're being treated. Um, and then uh, another way that a mask can keep you alive is by keeping things out, uh, like, like, like uh, tear gas or phosgene gas or nerve gas, um, or, uh, or, <laughs> or to some extent, water. Certainly, certainly wearing, a ma wearing a mask can keep you alive if you're underwater for a long period. And the imagery of these masks, that they, they had come with their own layers of, of, of meaning. If you see somebody portrayed with a scuba mask or uh, a World War I gas mask or something, there's a whole bunch of associations and, and cultural meanings that go with that. And that can be usefully employed in the visual arts or I suppose described by uh, people such as yourselves who, who type their fiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rachel points out that masks do evoke very strong emotions. Uh, I mean, you can see you can see right now in the United States how much uh, how much emotion there is around the topic of masks. Uh, talking about uh, Muslim, some some Muslim women wear uh, wear headscarves that obscure their faces, and a lot of people are up in arms about that. Um, there, uh, you know, why is it? Why is it that, that these things are so important to us emotionally? That's a whole culture thing that uh, we've kind of been brainwashed in certain regards in certain places. And I was really hoping to stay away from this political angle because I go on rants very easily. <laughs> well, my, uh, uh, the thing that had occurred to me as we were talking about um, the use of masks in literature, the use of masks symbolically um, in some Western um, contexts as not only obscuring the face or being about the face, but about obscuring the entire identity. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering um, if there's something catching in that idea um, that um, people are condensing the two things are perceiving this as being asked to conceal their identity uh, when they put on a plague mask. Um, I'm not talking about mm -hmm. on a, um, I'm just talking in an anthropological things merging into other things level, not a um, superficial level. But I think that um, some of the viscerality may come from the fact that um, in some ways we conflate uh, masks and identity. Yeah, yeah. Well, and we've, you know, we treat faces differently than almost anything else in our visual field. We've got, we've got entire fairly large brain structures dedicated to, to face detection, which is why, you know, you can see, you, you see basically any three marks um, can be read as a face, um, that, that we will see faces in places that no faces actually actually exist in a way that you're much less likely to to view a random mark as a handprint say or or as a tooth um, that that we see faces because we are hardwired to recognize them um, and so if you obscure or modify or disfigure the face you are really changing the person um, there's a really deep seated uh, deep seated issue um, in, I think, in human beings, certainly, certainly in this culture, of viewing people with disfigured faces as somehow, uh, somehow evil. Um, there's an awful lot of fiction that keys off of that idea, and we need to be careful not to fall into that trap. So if, uh, yeah, Bill. Well, when, when made the point uh, very early in this, uh, in this panel that, uh, that the, the face has uh, a, a, a 
we, we put a lot of attention in the face, as you were saying. It occurs to me that uh, that if if you obscure your face, I might emotionally perceive that as you're jamming an important signal that gives me information about you. That way, and that uh, an important source of information that I use that all of my my low level processing uses to to understand uh, the 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 other um, apes in the world. Uh, and uh, so I'm gonna, I might have an emotional reaction just to like, I can't see that guy's face. Uh, wow. And, and when I, if I put on my mask and then go in front of the mirror, I'll have a set of emotions about my own face and, and a whole bunch of complicated loops about how I present myself to the world and what other people are gonna think of me. Uh, so maybe this is, this is a kind of, uh, of single jamming that the, that the, uh, the, the subconscious resents. I, if it wasn't yes. for the incredible fashion wave a few years ago and growing to uh, huge numbers in s the Southeast Asian, uh, I might agree with that. But apparently, you know, we've got this whole population that said, no, masks are the coolest things going. There is no anger here. Uh, <laughs> Love it, David. Um, yes, everybody will be wearing them soon. They're very comfortable. <laughs> I understand. I'm sorry, I should have started off. Feature. Yes, uh, but it, but anyway. Um, so uh, I'm I'm sorry. I, I didn't I didn't realize I didn't realize I would be interrupting you. Um, oh, no, I was saying that again. I'm trying not to go okay. off the cliff. I'm crazy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, I would. But it is, it is true. Yeah. Please. I, I, your, your response to my suggestion is, when is, uh, is, is extremely valid, but, but the, the, uh, the sort of gut reaction I was talking about is, is only part of the many you know, feelings and thoughts that we have associated with uh, it. But culture is complicated and I think your yeah. your 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 observation that that yeah there's a, a big wave of people a lot, millions of people who are very positive uh, positively inclined playing wearing masks uh, as part of the fashion in their culture that's yeah. a, a few layers up from the sort of visceral uh, yeah um, it's just verbal reaction so I was disappointed that we have people in our society who think stabbing employees is a correct response to being asked to wear a mask. Uh, and I'm trying to avoid that subject because <laughs> I'm very angry yeah, at our population. That's a whole nother so, thing. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people are, uh, yeah. all the subject I'm seeing a lot of people wear like um, plague doctor masks and stuff and talking about, um, uh, it's just interesting to me that um, we go back to the same imagery, you know, uh, you can trace straight from plague mask now to plague mask previous. Um, <clears throat> so uh, do you feel like there's any difference between the use of full face masks and partial face masks? Or of course, Phantom only has the quarter face mask. I've always wondered why everybody seemed to think as the mask like David just put on actually obscures your face enough that you can't be recognized. That has always been a, you know, the Superman glasses. It's like, no, you, can, yeah. you should be able to, if you're anyway familiar with the person, um, be able to recognize if it's just this. Um, yeah, and I've never understood yeah, the, the whole. The well, in-universe I mean, explanation was... for Superman's glasses. <laughs> Sorry, Rachel. Um, I think that was uh, what I was trying to get at uh, with the consolidation of um, mask and identity, right? So that you don't have to even, not even a full face mask is now obscure who you are, but all you have to have do is gesture at a mask and that, um, is an identity concealer, right, symbolically. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, 
Um, well, one thing, for example, the Tim Burton Batman did something that previous cinematic Batmans uh, had not done, which is change the voice. So, so, and, and that, has become, that has become an absolute part of the character is that, is that Batman's voice is different from Bruce Wayne's voice, which I, th I, think, I think it's obvious but it was just never mentioned. It was never used in fiction before. Yes, Bill. I see also that chat is talking about the fact that the Superman and the TV show, at least, so dissembled into, I'm kind of a foolish person. I, you couldn't possibly think of me as that suave, powerful person. And they did it so well mm -hmm. that um, the glasses did kind of work in a kind of way, yeah. but it was, a, a full personality mask. Bill has. Yeah, it. Bill. It, it's a it's a challenge to actors to kind of sell this idea that Superman doesn't really is somehow perceived as different from Clark Kent, even though he doesn't look very much different. But I wanted to say that uh, a, a, that there was a problem set for people who were trying to make a radio show about Superman back in the nineteen forties. And uh, so if you listen to those, you can hear Bud Collier, uh, the announcer for To Tell the Truth in, in my time. But, but, but in the 40s, he was a radio actor and Bud Collier played Superman very, very well on the radio. And Clark Kent had kind of a soft, wimpy guy voice. Uh, and when he was like taking off his coat and changing into Superman costume in the phone booth, you would the, the the listener would hear that uh, that Clark Kent say, "This looks like a job for Superman." Up, up and away. You say up, up and away because you're about to fly, and nobody's going to know that you're about to fly unless you announce. <laughs> I'm it. flying now. So they're <laughs> setting a, and, a set of, of of dramatic problems, and Bud Collier is like brilliant in this role and went on to play the voice of Superman in animated Superman cartoons of the 1970s. Yeah, and the and and also the the Fleischer Superman cartoons used the voice change. You know, this looks like a job for Superman, and and with the up up and away. And uh, we also have the radio show to thank for the invention of kryptonite. Uh, which they invented so that the actor who's playing Superman could get a week off. Um, but we're just about out of time. Uh, so this is, this is our chance to, um, to mask up and, uh, and give our, and, and give our, put it, put our masks on before we go out into the cold crew world, uh, which is another, another function of a mask is keeping warm. Um, so, uh, oh, uh, somebody in, somebody in chat wanted to know, Bill, what was your call sign? Uh, I was not a fighter pilot. I bought this helmet, from a uh, hippie at a garage sale in 1978, he was using his uh, motorcycle helmet. I don't know what its provenance was before that, but at some point, it was it belonged to the U.S. Navy. Uh, cool. And uh, if you get a chance to get a fire pilot helmet for 15 bucks, then you go and you, you yeah find a buddy and borrow 15 bucks and you buy it. So. For many years, Barry Game and I owned this jointly. But but no, I, wow. I didn't have a call sign. Two heads are better than one. Okay, so uh, wrap up, um, Rachel. Um, any any closing remarks? Um, I brought up makeup artists um, in uh, chat. I think there's stuff, cool stuff about science fiction makeup, very thick makeup that the actors have to act through. That's about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's another thing we didn't mention about masks is the problems of communicating through a mask. Um, okay, Bill, uh, any closing remarks? I just want to reveal that actually I have all along <laughs> been Clark Wendell. Because <laughs> uh, Good Old Mission Impossible was, was the great mask TV show of my youth. It is. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, definitely. Martin Landau. I think he was, he was the big mask. All of that. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I've got a, I've got a zipper that runs all the way up, and and I, I peel it off and reveal that I'm actually me, uh, which which happened in Cats. Uh, 
That's a really disturbing movie. Um, okay, so yeah, so I think I think we're all just going to rip off our faces and and reveal that we are actually each other. Um, and uh, and so uh, so when no no you can't can't top that. Um, no, not really. I can't even okay, think cool. anything that will compress into one minute. Yeah. Okay. So um, thank you all very much for, uh, for attending. Uh, there's a link to the Discord server um, in the chat. Uh, and if you'd like to continue this conversation, uh, you're welcome to go over there. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, to, the next, uh, to the next panel, so I will not be, uh, I will not be in the Discord. Uh, but I hope that if you're interested in continuing the discussion, that you can go there. So uh, thank you very much to Rachel, who has just left. I hope she feels better soon. Uh, thank you to Wen and to Bill. Um, and thank you to our backstage staff uh, for making everything work.